you have multiple clinical death experiences in the same event because I'd reach for uh, the pacemaker to readjust it, uh, let go of his heart uh, compression, hit flatline once more, convulse eyes, turn up blue, sputters, convulse a little bit. Um, but he started him up again, just like your viewer can. It's easy. Uh, he wasn't any more hair on end, wild, fighting me off. What are you fighting me off for? And we were asking him, what, there's fire down there? You say you're in hell? Tell us about it. So we were interviewing him during the recess day. But this prayer got him. He had some sort of a religious conversion experience on the floor. He wasn't afraid anymore. Yet he still had these convulsions, death, quiet. The strange thing, saying this make-believe prayer to keep him away from me, backfired and got me too. That's why I'm on your program. That's why I wrote the book. It's a compelling thing. It, uh, once I saw the help pro I'd been discarding all these wonderful, beautiful experiences beforehand that repeated, um, that's not for me, tell the minister or somebody. And then I started collecting the negative cases that, in fact, I concentrated on. And then I found that you've got to be there with them during the resuscitation before that F on the report card is sublimated away into the mind. So the bottom line is you would say it's not safe to die. It wasn't for him. He wasn't expecting it. And you're not supposed to die on a treadmill, one in 5,000. Mm -hmm. That was it. Okay, we're going to talk about the implications of all these experiences, what they mean. But the fact is, let's get some more. Nancy, as uh, the president of International Association for Near-Death Studies, you are now starting to catalog some of these experiences as well. You've got over 50 in your paper here. The question is, uh, what are you seeing? Well, we're seeing that there is no one type we see three. Um, there's the kind that Howard described, which is a, a very hell-like experience. There's another type which sounds as if it should be the peaceful, blissful kind, but people are terrified, uh, usually because it seems to go too fast. It's out of their control. Uh, and a third kind in which people find themselves in just um, a featureless space. It, it's very much like being shot into space without the space capsule. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's the void, the um, indescribable emptiness. Mm -hmm. Junie, you have worked at Johns Hopkins, uh, at the hospital there, and uh, they don't just let anybody work on those patients. You've got to be a smart cookie to work there. And the fact is, is that you have worked, I think, in the toughest area. All the doctors and nurses that I know say working with children that are dying is the toughest thing. You usually go home with all their problems. That's true. Okay? What have you seen in terms of the good and bad experiences? Well, when we talk about the adults, um, I should say that, uh, let me preface this by saying this. When we talk about suicide, I don't either condone it or condemn it. I, I do say nothing about that. But the three people that I worked with uh, before I was working with the terminally ill children was in the emergency room. Now, these three people, it was two women and a man, they committed suicide. They were brought in, pronounced dead, and resuscitated. Uh, I got to talk to them later and they told me they weren't in pain, they weren't dying of cancer or some a disease that was tormenting them. They did it out of spite for a lover. And uh, they told me they saw demons worse than hell. It was undescribable and they were frightened and the bottom line is they would never do it again. I don't know how it changed their life because I didn't follow through with that. But what they saw was horrendous. Mm -hmm. Now it's different with children. Uh, children, uh, the ages that I deal with from two to six and six to eleven did not commit suicide. Yes. Uh, Dr. Rawlings, I think you would admit that people like Howard that come forth with this kind of a terrible story, you usually don't find it. Why? Uh, they hide it. They don't want their face on television or any identification because it's so embarrassing. It's like being caught naked. Your soul is exposed. It's an F on the report card. It's uh, 
uh, the audience uh, wants to know immediately, tell us this horrible thing, you, what kind of a rotten person were you to deserve this? You'll get all the good cases. They can't wait to tell anybody. But the hell mm -hmm. case, they have to have a conversion or they have mm -hmm. to have something good result so they can then present the bad. Yeah, I think, Howard, let's ask that question because a lot of people are saying, well, Howard, what did you do that sent you to hell? It was um, a life led according to what our culture teaches us. Look out for number one, you know, um, be self-centered. And the, we don't live in a Christian culture. We live in a culture that teaches materialism and um, self-promotion. That's what I did. And I denied the faith that I had been given as a child, and I turned my back on it. Okay, how did you get out of hell? Through prayer, as simple a, as simple as that. And, and what did you say? Really? What did you say? I asked Jesus to save me, and it was important for me to acknowledge Jesus Christ as my personal Savior because that's how I had been shown the revelation of the true God as a child, and that's how God had reached out to me. That's who I'd, whose name I'd been baptized in, and that's how I had to communicate with God. Dave Hunt, we've only got about 30 seconds left, and you know, you've written books that have sold a couple million, three, maybe three, four million copies of your books. And the fact is, when you write to these people, if they were to ask you, hey, I don't want to experience what he experienced, I don't want to, I don't want to go to hell, I don't want to experience that now or any time, what advice would you give them not to go to hell? Well, you're going to have to do exactly what Howard did, call upon Jesus to save you. Somebody says, why Jesus? Why not Buddha? Why not Muhammad? Why not somebody else? Because none of them did what Jesus did. He is God who became a man to die for our sins. He's the only one. Buddha said, don't come to me with your sins. I got my own to worry about. Don't follow me. I don't know the way. Jesus said, I am the way. He made claims nobody else made. He did what nobody else did. And he rose from the dead and he's alive. And you just can't escape it. There, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Either he's a liar or he's the, what, he said, what he said he is. And Howard called upon him and that's the only way. All right. Hopefully you'll join us next week because we're going to talk about the implications of both the good near-death experiences as well as the implications of the bad experiences and I hope that you'll join us. All right, welcome to our program and we have a group of uh, distinguished guests with us and we're talking about clinical death experiences, near-death experiences. The Gallup poll says that there's been about 13 million Americans that have had these kind of experiences, and they are coming back with a similar pattern and, uh, of what they experience and what they see. And what we want to talk about is, what do these experiences tell us? Do they tell us solid information? Is it proof about life after death? If so, what kind of existence is there after death? What are we finding out? And um, Nancy, start us off with the characteristics. What is the pattern that uh, these millions of folks that are having these uh, clinical and near-death experiences, what are they coming back and telling us? Not everybody will hit all of these, but characteristics include the feeling of being out of the body. There may be movement through a tunnel or space, encounter with a light, uh, which is not just visible light, but um, a radiant, loving presence, or as a corollary, uh, the absence of that light, which may be perceived as, as a very what deep and often unloving darkness. Uh, presences a uh, review of one's life is very common. Um, and then um, a return mm -hmm. with, with life-changing after effect. I mean, the, the experience is so powerful that whatever the kind of experience, it has the ability to make people's lives different. Mm -hmm. Dr. Maurice Rawlings, we already covered this in one program, but what if somebody looks at Nancy and looks at the rest of us and says, hey, it's nothing more than what your mind is uh, giving back to you just like in a dream. Why is it more than that? 
Uh, one uh, is life-changing. It